Last lesson for the transformations uh, unit. It's uh, the last kind of type type of transformation. So we've looked at um, we've looked at horizontal stretching, compressing, vertical stretching, compressing, shifting light left, right, up, down. We've also looked at something called a vertical and horizontal reflection. Uh, the inverse of a function is actually kind of like a diagonal reflection. It's going to be reflecting across the line y equals x instead of across the x or y axis. Like a vertical or horizontal reflection, we're going to be reflecting across the line y equals x. So inverse of a function, we have a notation to indicate um, that we're finding or have the inverse of a function. And the notation is this f with this thing. It looks like an exponent of negative 1, but it's actually just notation. It's not an exponent. Um, to get the inverse of a function, to reflect it diagonally across y equals x, all we have to do is essentially switch the x and y coordinates with each other. So if f at 5 equals 13 for the inverse of the function, so that's with this little notation here, that negative 1, that tells us we have the inverse. For the inverse, f at 13 would be equal to 5. So here we have the point 5 comma 13. That's what that tells us. For f at x, when x is 5, y is 13. But for the inverse of f at x, when x is 13, y is 5. So all that's happened is the x and y coordinates have just swapped with each other. So the inverse of a function has all the same points as the original, except the x's and y's have been switched with each other or reversed. Um, <clears throat> if we're actually going to draw the inverse of a function, all we need to do is have the points through the original function and then swap the x's and y's with each other. And then we can plot those and we have the graph of the inverse of the function. And it's going to look like it's just been reflected diagonally across the line y equals x. So let's actually do a question where we find the inverse of the function g at x. So g at x is equal to this transformed version of, it looks like our parent function is root x. So I'm going to, since this square root here, that tells us that our parent function, I'm going to call the parent function f at x. The parent function is root x. So we'll have to remember what that looks like. Um, we'll have to apply the transformations to that parent function using our a, k, and c values to get the points for our transformed function g at x and then we don't want to graph g at x or we do want to graph g at x but our end goal is not only to graph g at x but we also want to graph this the inverse of g at x and remember this exponent or it's not an exponent it's a notation this negative one is not an exponent it's just a notation telling us it's the inverse of g at x which means we just take all our x and y coordinates from g at x and we switch them all with each other and we will get the coordinates for the inverse of g at x. And I think on this page over here, I forgot to scroll down, but I actually made a note here. And important to note, inverse of f at x, this negative one here, it's read as the inverse of f at x, not f to the exponent of negative one. This negative one does not behave like an exponent. This does not mean one over f at x doesn't act like an exponent. It just means the inverse of f at x. Let's get back to this example. So first, uh, key points to the parent function root x. Hopefully you remember, um, I chose perfect square x values so that we can get integer values for y. Square root each of those, 0, 1, 2, 3. That's what the parent function root x would look like. Well, what would the transformed function g at x look like? Okay, well, let's start with the horizontal transformations. k is negative a half. So first of all, that's going to be a horizontal reflection because it's negative. So the x's are going to have to be multiplied by a negative value to change the sign of them. And the k value, we always have to flip it. So we have to do 1 over a half, which gives us 2. So it's going to be a horizontal stretch by a factor of 2. So we'd have to multiply the x's by 2. Combine those two things, multiply the x's by negative 2. That's the only horizontal transformation. Vertical transformation, right? So this was our k. This is a. This is c. A and C both um, are vertical transformations. A, negative 2, vertically stretch by a factor of 2 and vertically reflect. So I'd have to multiply the y's by negative 2. C value of 3, that means shift it up 3. So I'll apply these transformations to the points of the parent function and get the, get the image points for the function g at x. So multiply the x's by negative 2. There are my x values. The y's, also multiply them by negative 2 but then add 3. So <clears throat> 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, plus 3 is negative 1. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, plus 3 is negative 3. 
there's the points for the function g at x. Let's start by, actually, let's graph g at x. So plot the point. Oh, and notice I made my scale go by twos so that I could actually fit these points onto the graph. So the point 0, 3 would be right here. The point negative 2, 1 would be right here. The point negative 8, negative 1, negative 8, negative 1 would be right here. And the point negative 18, negative 3, uh, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, negative 3 would be right here. So remember the parent function root x, just roughly, it looks, well, not, not quite like that, more like this. That's what root x looks like. Uh, make, like curved looking. It only exists to the right, um, uh, to the right of the line uh, x equals zero, right? Because we can't plot, we can't square root a negative number. But keep in mind our transform function, it's been horizontally and vertically reflected. So instead of continuing up to the right, it's going to be flipped vertically and horizontally. So it's only going to be continuing, oops, and I should do this in blue, down to the left. I didn't connect those very well, but you can imagine me going through those points with a smooth curve. <clears throat> I'll try and do it a bit better. Continuing in the downward to the left direction. So that's what our function g at x looks like. If we want the function uh, inverse g at x, what we have to do is we have to take all of these points and just swap the x's and the y's with each other. So instead of 0, 3, we'll use the point 3, 0. So 3, 0, 1, negative 2, negative 1, negative 8, negative 3, negative 18. So I just kept all these same points, just swapped the x's and the y's with each other. So if I plot those points, <clears throat> 3, 0, 1, negative 2, so 1, negative 2, negative 1, negative 8. So negative 1, negative 8. Oops, wrong way. And negative 3, negative 18. I believe that's negative 18. 10, 12, 14, 16. Yeah. I would get this function. And notice this is our transform function. Uh, sorry, this is the inverse of our transform function g at x. So the inverse of g at x looks like this. And hopefully you notice this looks like it was a diagonal reflection through the line y equals x. So if I drew the line y equals x, it would look like this. And notice the inverse of g at x, oops, let me fix that. The inverse of g at x is just a reflection across this line. Each point has just been reflected across the line y equals x. So that's how we graph g at x and its inverse. You find the key points for g at x by doing the transformations necessary, swap all the x's and y's with each other, and we get the, tr we get the um, we get the graph of the inverse of g at x. Make sure you label them both properly. Um, <clears throat> next thing I want to do is I want to look at, okay, we can make the graph of the inverse, but what if I wanted to write the equation of this inverse function? So I want to write the equation of the inverse of this. Here's what we're going to have to do to write the equation algebraically. So first of all, replace f at x with y, right? f at x means y. And then you know for inverse function, the x and the y switch with each other. So in the equation, we do that exact thing, switch the x and the y variables with each other, and then rearrange the equation to isolate for y. So here's what it looks like. So replace g at x with y. So y equals 3 at x over 4. Uh, inverse functions, the x's and the y coordinates switch with each other. So we'll do that in the equation. Instead of writing y, we'll write x. Instead of writing x, we'll write y. 
And now we just rearrange this equation algebraically to isolate y. So multiply the 4 over, and then divide the 3. And then lastly, we'll write the proper notation. Instead of writing y, we will write the inverse of g at x. Right? We no longer have g at x. We have now the inverse of g at x. It's equal to 4x over 3. So that one's done. This one, function is h at x. Let's write the equation algebraically <clears throat> of the inverse of h at x. So we start, replace h at x with y. Swap the x and the y with each other, so x equals 4y plus 3. And now rearrange the equation to isolate the y. So move the 3 over, so x minus 3 equals 4y, and then divide the 4. And then now that it's rearranged to isolate y, we replace y with the notation for the inverse of h at x. So inverse of h at x equals x minus 3 all over Four. <clears throat> I don't know if we need to keep do. I don't. I don't think we need to do that example. That's similar to what we already did. But c. So f at x. Let's write the equation for inverse of f at x. First by changing it to y. Then by swapping the x and y with each other. So x equals y squared minus one. Move the mi so now we want to isolate y. So x plus one equals y squared. And then to move the squared over, we have to square root, but then don't forget, we have to consider both possible answers for the square root of x plus one, the positive and the negative, or else we would only get half of the graph for the inverse of the function. And now that y is isolated, we can go ahead and replace that with the symbol for inverse of f at x equals plus or minus the square root x plus one. Uh, let's do last example for this one. Uh, <clears throat> when we have a quadratic written in standard form, to be able to write the equation of the inverse, first thing you're going to have to do is convert it to vertex form. Uh, we'll first change f at x to y. So y equals 2x squared plus 16x plus 29. Uh, notice that there's two x's in the equation and one of them is squared, so we can't collect. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to transfer this to vertex form by completing the square. So hopefully you remember how to complete the square. 2x squared plus 16x goes in brackets, plus 29 off the end. Factor out just the 2 from the first two terms. x squared plus 8x plus 29. Add and subtract half of the 8 squared to get us a perfect square trinomial in the brackets. So half of it is 4, squared is 16. So add and subtract 16. And then we take the negative 16 out of the brackets so that all we're left with is a perfect square trinomial in the brackets. Take it out by multiplying it by the 2 that's out front, which gives us negative 32, plus 29. Inside the brackets, we have a quadratic. It's a perfect square trinomial. If we find the numbers that multiply to 16, add to 8, it's 4 and 4. So we could factor it x plus 4 times x plus 4, which is x plus 4 squared. Negative 32 plus 29 is negative 3. Here's our quadratic. It's now in vertex form. So now what we can do is swap the x's and y's with each other. So what we did up till now is complete the square. Now we'll go through the process of writing the equation of the inverse of the function by swapping x and y. So x equals 2 y plus, sorry, y plus 4 squared minus 3. Now we'll isolate the y, move the minus 3 over, we get x plus 3. We'll also have to divide the 2. And now I'm going to have to move the squared over. And remember from before, we're going to have to consider the plus and the minus, both options when we square root this, so that we get the entire function and not just half of it. And then lastly, you'll move that plus 4 to the other side. It becomes a minus 4. I'm going to put it in front, so negative 4. Plus or, plus or minus the square root of x plus 3 over 2 is equal to y. y is now by itself, so I can write the inverse notation, inverse of f at x. So that was just gone through really quickly how we can algebraically write the, algebraically write the equation of the inverse of a function. So if it's a quadratic in standard form, first convert it to vertex form.
swap the x's and the y's, isolate y, and then write using the proper notation. Okay, so that's it for the transformations unit.